It isn't a, a bark garden, but that's what it looks like right now. There's plants everywhere, you just can't see them. One of the plants is Coropia. It'll start growing as soon as it gets warm. There's some interesting sedum, autumn joy that are just tiny little sprouts right now. So in this garden, uh, we took you through each step where we first killed the lawn and removed it and taught you how to do that. And then we set up for a combination decomposed granite gravel walkway with edging. We put that right through the middle uh, of the garden to make the garden what I call interactive so you can easily walk through it. And then we showed you the irrigation system and we transitioned from a spray system which throws water everywhere. Even when you try to control it, you get water in spots that you don't want it. And we changed that to a drip system. We also showed you how to repair a cracked and raised concrete walkway that was caused by tree roots. So we're here at Eileen's completed Xeriscape. We went through a lot of steps and we're gonna show you all about it and what goes into doing a re-landscape. And I'm told that these videos are a lot more interesting if we talk about our mistakes, but um, this will probably be boring because we just don't make mistakes, so there's nothing to talk about. But I'm gonna show you everything we did right. So this whole garden is gonna look green, even in the middle of the summer, unlike now where it looks brown. The greenness is provided by a really neat, relatively new introduction into the horticulture industry called Coropia. Coropia is a really tough uh, ground cover. It's a hybridization of an old-fashioned Lipionata flora, which is a tough, easy to grow ground cover. The problem with Lipionata flora is it goes dormant in the winter, looks like a bunch of sticks. Coropia stays green most of the year, depending on the severity of your winters, and grows much lower and can be mowed. Very tough, easy to grow, water efficient, pest and disease resistant. It's really a great plant. Not spectacularly showy, but looks very respectable all the time. Gets a little white flower that I wouldn't plant Coropia just for the flower, but the flowers kind of neat a little bit in the middle of the summer. If you don't like the flowers, uh, you can just mow the Coropia and you mow the flowers right off and you can keep it mostly looking green. A lot of information on Coropia online because UC Davis did a lot of work into researching its ability to conserve water, specifically as a lawn replacement. It does relate to being water efficient because you don't have to water it. So we defined the edges of our path with anodized aluminum edging. It's called Permalock. It's a nice, easy to install product. And then we graded that out appropriately to where uh, we almost treat it like we're building a little road. We want it to be sturdy, but we don't want it to be expensive. So we use some base rock and then we use some decomposed granite and then we top it with just a little bit of pea gravel. The owner said she appreciates the crunch you get when you walk on it. It has some texture to it and you do hear it, but it, you don't sink in it because it's just a thin layer. So it's easy to walk on, it's firm. Even if you had to roll something on it, you could. So that's because we compact all of those layers together and we don't have a lot of anything uncompacted. And so we, we We use the vibratory compactor on the pea gravel and we come up with this very useful, reasonably attractive and yes, water conserving uh, path. It's water conserving because we don't need to water it at all. We're after uh, something that's very easy on the eyes and so it just uh, curves very gently, goes exactly from one point to another and has a bench uh, resting nearby so that you can sit on the bench as you enter the backyard or right before you enter the backyard. In this garden, we talk about it being interactive so that it's not just something you look at and run through to get to the front door, but something that can be used. We added a bench in this case, which we hadn't talked about before. We just expanded the walk and put a bench in a logical place right before the back gate. 
this is a very useful spot for a nice bench and it goes nicely with this whole idea of walking through the garden and using garden. Uh, she does have a nice courtyard with other types of seating um, and so the bench adds to that. We also repaired some flagstone that had damaged mortar. We installed this originally 18 years ago and it's really kind of neat to come back 18 years and see that none of the mortar in between the flagstone is cracked except in one spot and so that can teach us a lesson. Right in this spot where it was all cracked and broken is where the city sidewalk had raised a little bit because of tree roots, those nasty tree roots that we're always trying to control. And because it raised, then the flagstone was just a little bit low. And because we had a spray system, we kind of got water in spots that we didn't want it. Water would collect right in that spot on top of that mortar. And that's really what uh, damages mortar is moisture. And then you have the vagaries of different seasons, a lot of cold weather, a lot of hot weather. And so you have expansion and contraction, and that's what causes mortar to crack. So two things are important to try to avoid that if you have uh, flagstone paving that you're trying to minimize cracking on. One is to grade it properly and, and have a provision for water to run off of it. And secondly, another helpful hint is to seal it right after installation. We use a glaze and seal, which is a brand. We put it over the stone and the mortar and by doing that, then the water doesn't seep through and it's protection to try to keep the integrity of the mortar. We tried to clean up all the new brick. This again was brick we installed 18 years ago. And the one that looked the worst had calcium deposits on it from the sprinklers. And it's really difficult to get the calcium deposits off. Almost impossible. We uh, tried a lot of different things. The one thing that works, but it's a major uh, project, is uh, sandblasting. And we've done that on projects. Uh, in our case, in our area, there's a minimum charge to bring that crew out of $3,500. So you, get, you should have quite a bit of work for them. And the sandblasting does miracles, really. It makes brick look new. In this case, we didn't want to go to the expense of sandblasting in an existing garden with plants around the sandblasting is a problem. So we cleaned it with uh, muriatic acid and we tried some other things, vinegar, and did the best we could and got it as clean as we could. Then we used a pressure washer. And then we uh, sealed the brick and the sealer does restore the color and you'll see some spots in this garden where the brick really has returned to kind of a new uh, look. But you can also find spots where the calcium deposits remain and it's not like new looking. For just manual refurbishment, that's the best we could do. Uh, and uh, so, barking at the Amazon Prime. We talked about some problems created by traditional spray systems where you get a lot of water in spots that you don't want it. Even if you fine tune that system, it's hard to keep water only where you want it. In this case, we got water on top of the bricks that caused a lot of calcium deposits and a discoloration of the brick. And we got water on top of the mortar of the flagstone causing eventual cracking. By changing to a drip system that conserves water, there's merit just in water conservation, but in addition to that, now we're only applying water where we want it. We're not applying water where we don't want it, on the top of bricks, on the top of uh, flagstone paving. And so that will help with all of those issues or it's not hitting the side of the house, it's not hitting the fence, it's not spraying out into the road. It's only dripping slowly right where the plants are. So I might be a little partial and not completely objective, but of all the things I've told you about, I think the most important part of this garden is the quality of the soil. And that's probably the most important part of gardening. Without good soil, you're not gonna have success in terms of growing your favorite plants. What we did here to make sure that we have fertile soil that is full of life, 
We fed the soil in this case with three of our products. We mixed them together in a product we call Blend, and that is Optimize, Nourish, Biosol, and Maximize. And we were very generous with it here. We used it in more than one time. We liked the idea of getting it incorporated without doing any tilling or anything. So early on in the process, we did an application and then in the course of putting in irrigation and planting plants and uh, doing grading, you know, it gets moved around and mixed into a degree. And then we used a lot of it uh, when we planted all the plants and a lot of it again right before we put on the mulch. One of the neat things about it, you can't overapply it, you can't burn anything. Obviously, I have access to a lot of it, so I'm generous with it. But it's really beneficial even in very light amounts. Tell us all about your dream Xeriscape garden in the comments below. Last week, we asked you, what have you tried in a small garden that's been effective, and what do you recommend? Uh, what can help uh, all our subscribers and viewers? We got some excellent answers, and the winner is... If you'd like to see the transformation of Eileen's Xeriscape Garden in more detail, you can watch these videos here.